Okay, we'll start the next talk. So we have Michael Meinel talking from the German Aerospace Center about revisiting secure software engineering for research software. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, yeah, after two uh, kind of experienced talks, this is kind of more a non-experienced talk, but uh, I'll come to this later. So uh, it's about revisiting secure software engineering and uh, to uh, get you up to the speed. Um, what I want to revisit is a position paper that uh, colleague and uh, some colleagues and me um, published at the 2018 ICSE workshop SEAT. It was the first um, workshop of that. It's like uh, software engineering, uh, secure software engineering from design or something like this. And yeah, we had this position and vision paper because there was a new DLR institute um, which we tried to collaborate with and we just put up some ideas for data-driven automatic security, adaptation of software engineering methods to be more secure, stuff like this. And yeah, I reread this paper and I thought it would be time after four years to revisit to see what actually happened from our visions and yeah, that's why I'm here today. Um, I'm from the German Aerospace Center, big uh, research um, institute in Germany. We have like 40 plus institutes at or about 30 sites in Germany, currently 10,000 employees growing, so it's really big research institute and we do lots of stuff like research in aeronautics based transportation and then there is energy and security and digitalization, so this is really kind of um, important task also to look into software engineering and security with this. And I'm working in the group uh, in the Institute for Software Technology. Um, some of you might know my colleagues like Stefan Druska, Karina Haupt, Tobias Schlauch, who presented uh, here several times, and we do classical RSE work. So we have guidelines, software engineering guidelines for research software engin engineering. We provide tools and trainings, and we also do co uh, support and consulting. And yeah, I'm research software engineer since 2004 in the DLR, currently doing my uh, Master of Science in IT security, which is kind of lacking right now, but uh, short before my master thesis, and I also have my colleague with me, Martin Stoffers, which is uh, doing similar work like me, but only since uh, 2017 he joined my team, and he's master of computer science. And now let's have a short look into what was inside the paper. So uh, I really read it and thought, okay, lots of stuff which is written there is still relevant. So for example, um, scientists share their self-developed software, they do not develop software engineering and uh, are not developed by software engineering or security experts, so the scientists write the software as it is, and it's getting better. They have software engineers or research software engineers which uh, support them, but it's really uh, still lots of hacking code. And uh, yeah, afterwards the software is still shared or published, and they all, uh, even yeah, provide web interfaces for the software, and doesn't harden it at all, so they don't care about security. And um, yeah, we had this uh, conclusion already four years ago and had some strategy how to cope this. And since then, I had lots of new insights thanks to my master's studies and also thanks to new projects and collaborations. And the biggest problem I currently see is that there is no visible uh, network for secure software engineering in RSE yet, and that's kind of uh, my kickoff to maybe establish something like this. And uh, the other thing is the collaboration with our newly founded DLR Institute for S uh, Data Sciences uh, shifted the focus. So um, we're not collaborating so much anymore because they, yeah, four years ago they was we had just found uh, funded, and currently they're really uh, doing uh, yeah the their own strategies and developing their own plan. And that's why I wanted to revisit it. And <clears throat> the guiding questions for this talk are, first of all, how naive have we been? So what was our idea back then? Then um, the question, why did it not work out as expected? Then uh, what was our ideas, what want, uh, we wanted to do? And last but not least, of course, what's my view currently or our view currently, how to do it better? So the first thing is, um, yeah, the paper um, condensed in one slide is like you have the development process, which is design, implementation, tests in the circle, and afterwards you have code ready. So you can analyze this code, 
and evaluate the code. How secure is your software? And this is, uh, I wanted to show this is gauge. You need some kind of, yeah, some kind of um, measurement to see how good the software is in, um, in terms of security. And after that, you can derive good practices. So you change something in the development process, you change something in your um, yeah, kind of coding, and then you can measure again and see how the changes affected the, uh, the quality of the software. And afterwards, you can extract good practices for software developers, as we already have with our general software engineering guidelines. It was a very ambitious goal. So um, my idea was, for example, to have static and dynamic analysis with based on intermediate language code and machine learning and matching um, yeah, some exploit code against some implementation code and stuff like this. And yeah, it's really ambitious and uh, it doesn't work out yet as expected. But I still believe in large parts, especially about the, yeah, the part of uh, characterization of software. And I st uh, strongly believe that it's important to have an automatic measurement and an, yeah, um, fused measurement for software uh, security, like we have, for example, for code complexity or something like this. So what did really uh, work good, what did not work so good? So um, the Institute of Data Science did a lot of work in characterization, automatic characterization of program code. And they evaluated different, different tools. They um, yeah, have some large, large uh, studies done with public repositories and uh, achieved a high degree of um, automation but no common scoring yet. So this is the first thing. So they can automate the tools, they can put it in their, in their development process chains, but uh, afterwards you have a scoring for SASL and you have a um, scoring for the OVASP suite and so on and so forth, but you don't have a common, code, um, yeah, common scoring yet. And the other thing is they didn't really uh, concentrate on disruptive new methods. So they adapted old tools instead of developing new. This was a bit of a bummer for me, but it's okay. So it's like I can understand low-hanging fruits are, of course, well suited if you want to get an institute uh, up and starting. I hope that they are shifting towards more disruptive methods in the coming time. So ideas are still good, I think especially machine learning and looking at intermediate language code. But yeah, it's, uh, it's ambitious and let's see what the future bring. So, um, yeah, then the another, another aspect is we do not, not only need to um, monitor the quality of the software, but we also need to monitor the process which led to the software. And this is uh, something which is really uh, getting some focus and speed, especially in our institute. We have a really good um, sustainable software engineering group. We have um, yeah, repository mining experts and we are really um, yeah, looking forward into looking into the process of developing software, how the process which was designed is actually adopted and where there are yeah, problems. And yeah, this is uh, something which I think is currently really a good thing. For example, we have a provenance model to collect and uh, record software development processes and extract features from GitLab, GitHub projects, and stuff like this. So, but still there is also no metric or no possibility to uh, identify diversions from the process that was designed and the project that was applied. But this is something I think in the next two or three years there will be some good solution for this. So. And now the question is, why did it not work out? So there are lots of new questions are to be answered. So for example, how to monitor the changes and differences in the software engineering process? And how should such a common security characteristic could look like? Um, this needs to be um, yeah, answered. Then uh, the scientific approach needs time. So it's like uh, if you have a new idea, you implement it, you have to uh, characterize it, you publish it, and then you can see how good was it working. And this round trip time is really, in science, it's rather long. It's not like you have uh, every two weeks a new software version that you can evaluate, but you need really uh, months and years to evaluate this. And after all, um, another thing I really learned from my studies, the problems are different than expected. It's not like um, <laughs> that you um, yeah, 
<clears throat> so the requirement of secure software engineering in science is still not very well accepted. So the people think they wrote their software for 20 years, why should they change their mind and why should they now start doing security in it? And this is also something you need to make aware of the people that they need to do software engineering, especially if you really want to publish your software, you want to publish your data with your papers and stuff like this. Yeah. So how to do it better? So back to my picture from before. Um, this is something I really believe back then, I partly still believe, but the first important thing is when you look at software engineering for secure software, you can't really go, go on have common good practices. Every software is different, every software has a different um, yeah, problem interface and stuff like this, so you can't really have general good practice which works for everybody. So this is the first thing, and then closely attached to this is you need to really make aware the developers, that security is in fact important and security needs to be sought from the beginning. So this is a secure by design. This is a term which is um, more and more going on in the, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, in the um, scientific or in the software engineering um, community. And this needs to be aware, uh, needs to be aware for the developer. And they also need to understand what does this mean? What is a secure software engineering? And what is the problems I need to think before? And this is something like uh, you need to provide some tools to do some, yeah, some threat analysis beforehand. They need to know where are the critical points in their software which they are developing. And um, yeah, you need also to provide tools for them to, for example, assess the. Um, threat modeling, and last but not least, you need a network. So you need people who are behind this and who uh, support you with um, developing strategies to improve your secure software engineering, and that's why I'm here to start this process to have a discussion with other people um, how to go on with this problem. And this already concludes my talk. Um, I'm happy for questions and feedback, and I also have contacts contact notes if you want to reach out for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll open the slider again for the questions. Okay, we'll start at the top. Um, could you give examples of where security in software is important or essential? And what could happen if it's not considered? So, so my uh, very classical example is um, credentials in GitHub. So uh, if you search for research projects, you can find passwords, you can find pr uh, public keys, you can find passes on servers and stuff like this. And this is uh, something really, uh, which is a very low hanging fruit. And it's also automated by GitHub, they clean it out, but it's not perfect, it's still there. This is one very uh, obvious example. But other examples are um, the classical thing, you have a software to uh, evaluate the data set. And you publish your data set and scientists come to you, yeah, can I, use your software and you don't want to give out the code, so you wrap a small <coughs> web application around it. And then you have a web application which is not secure, uses code which is not trimmed for security and people can put in data into it from outside and try to manipulate your, your resources. And this is something which uh, already happened and which is still happening. So these are just two examples and I think the problem really uh, comes from, from uh, if you develop software, give it out or publish it, and then there are these uh, problems, security problems. So it's even, even if it's not uh, just um, a public web interface where you can upload your data, but if you scrape repositories, and then you can manipulate repositories that you know that are scraped and stuff like this. So this is a big, big problem, um, yeah. Okay, so the next one is, could you give some examples of resources for beginners to software security? Unfortunately, not really, and this is part of the problem. So I think uh, secure software engineering um, is a rather new topic and it's currently uh, captured by experts. And my idea is really to have some resources ready to um, make them aware, so um, maybe I could uh, look back in, so if you look at the SEAT conference, there was one talk about um, some guy who had a, a developed a game for threat modeling. And this is also something my colleague and I had an idea to have such a card game. So that you have a card game with uh, threat modeling or this uh, attack and uh, defense of your computer systems. And this is something that uh, just helps to make you aware. But the problem here is 
um, security is really a hard topic, and it's like uh, done by experts, especially if you're an attacker, you're especially an expert, and it's hard to um, yeah, protect from experts, so you most probably need an expert, but the first step is really to be aware, and uh, I think uh, making awareness is really uh, something that we can all carry out. I think related to that and putting you on the spot a bit, um, what are some fundamental security best practices you would suggest that all RSEs begin thinking about? So I guess what are the first steps beyond awareness? Yeah, most important, uh, think of security from the beginning. And even if it's your script, which are you only using on your computer to scrape your websites, it's still something you should consider from the beginning. And um, yeah. Uh, and that's basically the only best practice I currently have because uh, the, the problems you could have with your software are so different and there are so many mitigation uh, tactics. For this is really uh, the best practice, I would say, think of security from the beginning. And uh, to do this, the easiest step in my, in my eyes is uh, to do threat modeling. Even if you're not an uh, expert and you don't really need to have a complex threat model or a decision tree or whatever, just have some ideas about what could an attacker use or how could an attacker uh, use your software to attack your problem or your software. Thanks. So it says, how much security can you get for free from Git tooling, for example, GitHub automatically making pull requests to update dependencies? Lots of, but uh, the problem is these tools are public. So all the attackers know these tools and they don't focus on the problems that are captured by these tools. So you really, uh, they are ahead of you. So it's, it's important to have these tools and it's important to not do obvious mistakes in software security. You should integrate them as much as possible, but you don't need to be sure that it's it makes your software safe. And this is a problem which is still um, arising. So the people say, okay, I have some um, yeah, security checks in my tool chain. My software is rather secure, but they just check the wrong places. So use it, but don't uh, rely on it too much. We'll do one final question. Um, do you think there will be the need for RSSEs, so research software security engineers? Good question, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I think that uh, software engineers are able enough to do also security, especially if they started from the beginning. Um, there are mistakes you can, as a, new, a normal software, as a, um, a research software engineer, uh, you can uh, e um, already handle. And um, it's the more complex that your software gets, the more focus you need to put on them, so you might need experts, but I think uh, lots of research software engineers are already kind of experts because they are hobbyish doing, uh, doing security and stuff like this. So I think uh, in most cases, uh, user, uh, normal research software engineers should be enough. Great, thank you. We're gonna end five minutes early, so let's thank Michael again. <laughs>